talk is on Kingdom Protista. Uh, Kingdom Protista is the second grouping. Uh, we've already covered the, the uh, older archaic Monarin, the bacteria. Uh, we've looked at the Eubacteria and a little bit of the Archaebacteria. So this is the third out of six kingdoms in the six kingdom classification scheme. This is Kingdom Protista. All right, now the Protista are an extremely diverse assortment of eukaryotes, but they all have this common thread. The common thread is they are unicellular eukaryotes. Now, that's true for the most part. They are the unicellular eukaryotic organism, but it also includes the multicellular relatives. In other words, there are some plant-like organisms that have pigments that are very similar to the ones that you're going to see in the algae, in the single-celled algae. So, do we put these plant-like organisms um, with their single-celled uh, relatives, or do we put them with the multicellular cellular relatives that they have less in common with? And so the general con uh, consensus is that the seaweed, if you will, will uh, belong uh, with the protista uh, more properly. So we're going to take a look at them as well. And uh, we already saw the protozoan in the laboratory, but there are two particular types of protista. There's the protozoans and the, and the algae. The protozoans are animal-like uh, in that they can't make their own food. They're, heter uh, they're heterotrophs. Um, also, they, uh, they move around, so that's protozoa. And then the algae are plant-like protista. They, make, they do make their own food. Uh, they're photoautotrophic. And uh, being photoautotrophs, they have pigments. Uh, many of them are green. We'll see that in the laboratory. But there are a wide variety of colors, actually, and we're going to see that tonight. All right. So first of all, let's take a look at the protozoans. With the protozoans, the protozoans, again, are the animal-like protista. Now, when we classify the protozoans, we're classifying the, the uh, uh, protozoans on the basis of the motility of the trophozoite. When you take your uh, microclass, we'll say the motility of the troph for short. So uh, the troph is the adult stage. And so we take a look at the adult stage and see how it moves, and that's what the major classification point for these animal-like protista for the protozoans. Again, you saw these in the laboratory. But uh, just to remind you of what you saw, you remember that you saw two slides with red blood cells. Um, one had the trypanosoma on it, and they were kind of uh, looking like uh, spirilli bacteria. They were very wavy, uh, purple. Uh, just a few of them scattered about many red blood cells. So you saw that, and so we'll take a look at that as an example of uh, mass sigophrin today. And then we'll take a look at the, uh, the sporozoa, and the plasmodium that you saw in the laboratory scattered about a bunch of red blood cells. Uh, this is your prime example of a sporozoite, which is a protozoan that has an adult stage that doesn't move around. Um, also, you, what you saw in the laboratory is, is uh, letter A, the uh, sarcodines. And the sarcodines are things like the amoeba. Um, you were able to see some of you uh, live amoeba in the laboratory and uh, we're able to see them move around, and that was uh, pretty significant. Also, the last one, uh, most of you saw the paramecia in the laboratory. Those are ciliated. Obviously, this is an organizing slide, and there's many slides in, uh, for each of these, so let's take a look at the first one. Uh, the first one is phylum uh, sarcodina, also called the sarcodines, or sarcodinians are organisms in the phylum sarcodina. The best example of the sarcodines are the amoebas, Here's a photograph of one at only 185 power. So uh, these are fairly big compared to the paramecia that you saw in the laboratories whizzing around. These guys are pretty big chunks. Um, and you can see that uh, on my slide I have the pseudopodia pointed out. Uh, one is called a pseudopod, plural pseudopodia. Uh, pseudopods are how the amoebas move around. You're going to see the cytoplasm streaming within these arms as arm forms, and then you see the cytoplasm come in, and then this thing starts to engulf this paramecium. And so this is uh, how they move and also how they eat. This was also one of your post-lab questions, so uh, hopefully you got that. Okay. Um, here are some other 
some other sarcodines, uh, forams, uh, regularians, uh, heliozonas. These are also uh, other types of sarcodines, and they all move the same way. They all move by by having uh, this cytoplasm streaming. The cytoplasm is moving. Sometimes you can see it. Sometimes you can't. Uh, sometimes there's an, what's called an endoplasm and an ectoplasm that looks like there's there's cytoplasm within a cytoplasm. But the the main thing that you would see is that these fake arms come out. Pseudopodia. Now, pseudo is, uh, is the prefix for fake. Pod has to do with feet because if you go to the if uh, your primary physician sends you to the uh, podiatrist for your bunions, let's say, uh, the podiatrist is the foot specialist. So pod means foot, pseudopodia, fake feet. Okay, so those are, that's the first group. The first group are the sarcodines, and sarcodines move with the uh, pseudopodia. All right, the second group called the mastogophora. The mastogophora are flagellated protozoans. That means they have flagella. If you take a look at a picture on the left, uh, should be fairly familiar to you. You saw many, many more, more red blood cells, and this is a, this is actually a, a rendering of a, a different type of microscopic photograph that you would see. This is a scanning uh, electron uh, micrograph type of uh, picture, oh, and, and that's why you see it as a three-dimensional. But you can see that these are. These are the flag, uh, flagella right here, and you see this characteristic kind of a spiral kind of shape scattered amongst the red blood cells. Um, this is uh, the, uh, the actual, in this picture, purple uh, protozoan is called trypanosoma. And trypanosoma causes what's called African sleeping sickness. African sleeping sickness kills about 400,000 people a year. Uh, if left untreated, it could cause coma and obviously even death. Um, people who have African sleeping sickness um, often get uh, a, a very, they get, it gets very itchy in their eyes, and some people have been driven to commit suicide even because of the itchiness in their eyes. This is all caused and uh, uh, spread by, by this fly. It's called a sissy fly. It looks like sissy, or sissy, sissy fly. And a sissy fly, uh, once it bites you, uh, then the plasmodium here, blue instead of purple, plasmodium go into your bloodstream, and then you have it. Uh, flies, when they bite someone who is infected, can then pick that up and then carry it to a different person. So remember what we're looking at. We're looking at, pro at protista. Protista are single-celled eukaryotic organisms. And we divided the protista up into two different groups. We have the, the uh, protozoans, which are animal-like, and the algae, which are plant-like. So now looking at the animal-like protozoans, we see that they're classified on the basis of movement. So the first group, the amoebas, are an example of sarcodines. Sarcodines move because they have pseudopods. The second group, these guys are the mastogophorans, they have flagella, and that's how they move. The example is trypanosoma. Here's another example of a, a flagellated uh, protozoan, and this is Giardia. So if you're thinking, well, that's African sleeping sickness, I'm never going to Africa. Well, are you going to California? Because if you are, then you've got to be careful uh, and watch the Giardia. Giardia is an intestinal parasite, and it's found in California lakes, rivers, and streams. So if you've ever been to one of those, then you have uh, the potential of uh, picking up Giardia. Giardia causes intense diarrhea. I, I italicize intense because that's what I understand. I don't have any first-hand uh, experience, experience with Giardia, but my sister-in-law does. And my sister-in-law and her husband uh, went, because they're big outdoors people, on their honeymoon, instead of going to Hawaii or something, they went to Yosemite and got a, got a pass to go backwoods backpacking. Woo! And so that was their honeymoon, and uh, one of them contracted Giardia along the way and spread it to the other one. And so not the ideal honeymoon, I guess. I would guess, but I don't know. So, Giardia, uh, intestinal parasite found in California rivers. Watch out for this. Um, how do you, how does it get in the river? Um, if you have a river near near a farm, the livestock that have it could release it into the water. If you have any raw sewage going into the water, that would be another issue. If you have untreated sewage, uh, that could be a problem. Um, you're thinking it's livestock, and so you can, you know, move the farms away from the river, but 
Also, muskrats and beavers are known to carry Giardia. So, how do you keep a beaver out of the river? Hmm. Okay, the third type, the third group, the third type of movement is no movement at all. These are the sporozoans, and the sporozoans have a non-modal adult stage. The adult stage is it, it, uh, it just sits there, really. And so the example of this is plasmodium. Plasmodium is, a, is then a sporozoan that causes malaria. And if you take a look at the far left, there's a picture of a mosquito it's called Anopheles. Anopheles mosquito is a vector then in this case. And when the female bites you, she releases this stuff into your, uh, into your bloodstream. You can see it right here. And it floats around, goes around your bloodstream, finally finds its way to the liver matures in your liver, um, out pop the next stage called the merozoites. It's uh, still maturing, and this is, I, I guess it would be the teenage stage, and then the merozoites pop out uh, of your liver. Then they go out to the rest of the body, and every three or four days, your red blood cells explode very painfully. And so uh, there's different types of malaria. Uh, there's tertiary malaria, where your blood cells explode every three days, quaternary Malaria, where it explodes every four days, um, and so uh, yeah, uh, that's very painful. My dad had it twice. He had it. Um, he got it in World War II, and I think he got it around the Korean War as well. So he never had to give blood after that. He was always proud of that. I don't have to give blood. I had malaria twice. <laughs> All right. The next. The last of the protozoans are the ciliophorans. Uh, the ciliophora is the name. And what ciliophora do is they use cilia, these small hair-like structures, to move and to feed. The best example you have of ciliophora is the paramecia that you saw in the laboratory. And so there it is. You not have to know all these parts, but you should recognize paramecium as an example of the ciliophoran. They use these for feeding, they use these for movement. So here are four protozoans. You move with pseudopods, and those are, the example is the amoeba, and uh, those are, uh, are the sarcodines. We have the flagellated mastigophorans, like, uh, uh, what did we have? We have trypanosoma as your example, causes African sleeping sickness. The third one's the sporozoans, which cause malaria, uh, we saw, um, and this one here is the ciliophoran. Uh, an example is paramecia. Uh, they move with, with cilia. Yeah, Ken. Oh, sure. That one right there? Okay. So those are the four types of, of protozoans. But remember what we did with the protista. We're dividing up into two groups. We've got the animal-like protista called the protozoans. Protozoans are classified on the basis of movement. Now we have the plant-like algae. And they're classified on a major characteristic as well. Yeah. All those four are considered sarcodines? No, 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 no. The sarcodine is the first group with the amoeba. Okay. And then the second group is the, um, the mastigophorans. The mastigophorans uh, move because they have a big tail, flagella. And the third group is the sporozoa. And the sporozoa have, uh, have no movement in their adult stage. And my example was, uh, was malaria. Okay. And then the, this last group, the ciliophorans. Move with cilia and paramecia are the example. Okay. So now let's go to the single celled algae. These are the plant like protista. And so the plant like protista are, are divided up into, uh, well, the plant like protista are divided up in the single cell and the, and the multicellular algae. Whether they're single celled or, or multi celled, they're classified on the basis of their coloration, their pigmentation. Uh, specifically, if you take a look at their, their pigments, uh, such as chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, uh, phycolobins, uh, things like that, um, they would have similar, um, single, similar pigments. But generally speaking, we can associate the pigments with the colors. So, so that's what we do. And here are the three groups of single-celled algae. There's actually, uh, the largest group is the, the green algae. But I'm going to talk about them when I talk about the multicellular algae. Here are the other three types of single-celled algae. You have the euglenophyta, the chrysophyta, and the porophyta. Uh, and the uh, porophyta, 
uh, actually all of these, um, I have a P in front of their name, so it could easily be a D as well. Remember back when we looked at taxonomy, the phylum and the division are the same classification level. And when you have plants, we don't have phyla, we have divisions. So similarly, since these are plant-like, they're often called divisions. Sometimes they're called phylum as well. So you have phylum or division. In fact, I wrote P period here, but on the future slides, I think I have divisions. Let's see. Yeah, I did. So here's the first division. First division is Euglena phyta, and the best example of a Euglena phyta is Euglena. Um, this is the first one I want to mention because uh, it, is, it is an algae. It is green. It goes through photosynthesis. But if there's no light, it can move around and eat. So these are a little bit in between. They're, they're both uh, photosynthetic. They're both uh, autotrophic and they're heterotrophic. They, can, they eat too. Um, since they do eat, they have a way of moving around because if you, if you eat, you've got to go get what you're eating. Okay, so that's why we say they're mostly photoautotrophic because uh, yeah, most of the time they do make food by, by just responding to the light, by capturing light, light and going through photosynthesis. But if that's not a possibility, then they go and they, they capture their own food. So that's Euglena. The second group is division Chrysophyta. Chrysophyta means a golden algae, and you can see by the photos why they're called the golden algae. In, in the microscopic view, you can see they have some brown and gold coloration to them. Okay? Um, they have many, many different shapes. This is one of the first slides you saw on your very first microscope lab um, when we saw red blood cells, and then you also saw these uh, diatoms. Diatoms make up uh, part of what's called the plankton of the ocean. And, uh, and for us, uh, the application of this is something called diatomaceous earth. If you've ever, you know, uh, had to do the maintenance on your swimming pool, you get a big bag of diatomaceous earth and use this as part of your, your swimming pool filter. Also, it's a very fine abrasive, so it's, fine, it's found in toothpaste and such. So that's diatomaceous earth. Okay. These are photosynthetic and unicellular, and a common name for this group, I didn't write down, but maybe you did already, is, these are called the golden algae. So now we have algae classified on the basis of color. We have the euglena, which are green. We have the chrysophyta, which are golden. Then we have this next group. These are the fire algae, and it says division pyrophyta, and we take a look at the prefix, that makes sense, pyro, like pyrotechnics is when you work with fireworks. Um, so pyro means fire. These are called the fire algae. Uh, to distinguish them from the red algae, because there's another group called red algae, we'll see when we take a look at the multicellular uh, algae. But the pyrophyta are single cell that says caused by population explosions. I uh, should strike this of population explosions that release a neurotoxin. It's actually fairly toxic. I uh, looked it up this morning um, because it, I mean, how many clams do you have to eat in order to kill you or, or in, in order for you to get sick? And it's not as much as you would think. Um, also, there's a, there's a rule for fisher people, and it says that if the, if the month has an R in it, then you can eat shellfish. But if the month doesn't have an R in it, you should avoid eating clams and oysters and things like that, which is a fairly okay rule, but it's not fail-safe. Uh, the, the toxin's made throughout the year, but it's just uh, it, it's made more in the summer. So if you avoid it during the summer, great, but if you avoid uh, shellfish in, say, December, that doesn't mean you're not necessarily going to get um, uh, this, uh, this disease because of neurotoxins. Um, because they can still be produced all throughout the year. So what would happen is, that, and maybe you've seen this before, it doesn't happen that often in Southern California, but it does happen, and you hear about it in the news every once in a while, more so on the East Coast, but if you've ever seen that, and there's a boat right there, so you can see the, um, how, how far it spreads. So what shellfish do, like clams, they, they're sensor filter feeders. They'll, they'll eat a lot of these things and store it up in their tissues. So if you eat clams that have been eating this stuff, and you can build that up in your body pretty quickly. So these are the pyrophora. Uh, pyrophora cause red tide and uh, can be toxic if you eat too many of those clams. All right, the last group here are the multicellular algae. Multicellular algae are the reds and the browns and also the greens. The red algae are called the rhodophyta. The brown algae are called the phaophyta. 
and the green algae, which are both unicellular and multicellular, and I have them last because they're the biggest um, group of algae by far. Uh, we have the green algae, Chlaminomotus, Spirogyra, all kinds of others. Some of you have already seen in the laboratory. So let's take a look at those. Sure. Again, it has a P in front of it here, but it's also proper to call these uh, divisions because these are, even though not plants, they're plant-like. All right, so then we have the, the first group, the Rhodophyta. These are the red algae. It says here they contribute to coral reefs, and uh, the coral reefs are actually made by the coral, which are animals. Um, they're animals, small, almost microscopic animals, that what they do is they, they spit out the chemical that is the same chemical that makes shells in shellfish and oysters and clams. It's called calcium carbonate. And that calcium carbonate um, gets, uh, or hardens up. And that's what coral is. But these guys, these are the red algae that live on top of that. And they essentially form, uh, they're, they're living on the coral, but they are the producers of the coral reefs. Um, they are able to take that, take the filtered light um, sunlight and and change that into food, and so uh, these are these are then in essence the producers of the of the coral reef. They're also called seaweed commonly, but that's a term not readily used by biologists because seaweed can be red algae, brown algae, green algae. Uh, seaweed can also be higher plants. So um, so seaweed is is a term like bugs is to a to an uh, entomologist, you know. Uh, there are true bugs, but uh, a lot of people call any insect a bug. In fact, if it maybe you might even call a spider a bug if you're not careful about it. Ooh, a bug. And, uh, so that's a term that means all kinds of things. Seaweed is the same thing to a marine biologist. It's uh, all kinds of different organisms. When you say seaweed, what do you actually mean? All right, um, here's the second group. The second group are the Phaeophyta. Theophyta are the brown algae, and they also can be considered to be seaweed. You can see here they're large, complex seaweeds. You'll see these in a laboratory, not as a, as a microscope uh, uh, prepared slide, but we'll have uh, herbarium mounts for you to take a look at, large, large mounts about this big um, that are just large amounts of brown algae. You can see why they're called brown algae. In this photo, it looks green, but that's because the light gets filtered down as it goes into the ocean. So if it appears green in our photograph when we take it out of the water, it's brown. We use uh, Phaeophyta to make a chemical called algin. That's, uh, I wrote al auger, but I, I really meant algin, A-L-G-I-N. And what algin is, is that it's the smoothing agent in ice cream. Um, that's one thing that it's, it's used for. It's a, it's a binding agent that, that picks up uh, moisture really well. But it's, uh, its most important use, to my family anyway, is making ice cream. So it's the Phaeophyta. Um, auger is also made by taking um, seaweed and grinding it up. But um, uh, brown and red algae are used to make auger. All right. The best example for you of the brown algae are the giant kelp off our coast. Giant kelp are called macrocystis, and uh, giant kelp are interesting in that they are found in only a very few number of locations in the world. You've got to have something to hold on to for one thing. So you've got to have some rocky outcroppings instead of sandy beaches or sandy um, sandy bottoms of of the shallow oceans. So you've got to have rocks down there so that they kelp can hold on to that. They have a, a small root type structure called a hold pass. Um, and if, if you have one that's 65 feet tall, your hold pass is only about this big. So it's got to hold on to the rocks. Um, very quickly growing, it's said that kelp are the fastest growing um, organisms that we know of. This is a picture that I didn't take when I was diving because I'm not certified, but it's uh, it's from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And so if you've never been to Monterey Bay Aquarium, yeah. they have a yeah two-story uh, kelp forest exhibit, amongst other things. They've got an open ocean exhibit. It's got a million gallons of water and glass is thick, and you see schools of tuna. It's 
women around? Crazy. You ought to go. Anyway, giant kelp, example of Theophyta. It's a really big brown algae. And then here's the, the largest group by far. These are the Chlorophyta. Chlorophyta are the green algae. Now, the green algae can be many things. They can be unicellular or multicellular. You're going to see in laboratory, actually, today that um, some of them are like this largest picture here. Some of them are like the Volvox. The Volvox is actually made up of many different cells, but this is, isn't ready to be called a multicellular organism. But it's many unicellular organisms working together, so then we call it, the, we call it colonial. So you're going to see that in the laboratory. You can see that both as a prepared slide or they're actually they ordered a live specimen for you today. So uh, I bet you you'll be able to see some with the live specimen today because the morning group didn't tend to take from that, which is good for you. Now, the green algae are, are considered to be part of the pastures of the ocean. And those are phytoplankton. Plankton is a, a, a loose term for things that are floating around in the ocean. And these are the things that are floating in the ocean that are, are photosynthetic. And so these are the phytoplankton. These are the algae that are floating around in the ocean. It's thought that almost half of all photosynthesis that goes on in Earth is because of these single-celled algae that are floating around the ocean. So we tend to minimize those. We think of forests that are going through photosynthesis, but half the work is done by these single-celled algae that, are, that make up the pastures of the ocean. Make up the phytoplankton. Two comments. Yeah. How is that, how is that phytoplankton affected by all this plastic accumulating Well, lots of lots of marine organisms are affected by plastics. Um, more so organisms that are heterotrophic because they they feed on it. Um, I don't I don't know that that this and the plastics they they degrade pretty quickly. And some some uh, remote beaches have as as a significant part of their beaches they've got small small pieces of plastic. And so uh, they, they actually have a term for that. It's called beach confetti. And it, it's got all kinds of different colors. Like if you, you know, you're thinking in your garage or by your washing machine, you got, you know, a blue bottle of Downy or Clorox too. Well, it all breaks down in these really small pieces that are very colorful. But um, as far as how plastics affect these guys directly, I don't know if that's, I don't know if a study that's been done. But, of course, plastics affect the whole ecosystem. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So these plant-like foot pieces are broken down between single cell and multi-cell. Right. This is categorized under the multi-cell, but it's called single cell because it's a single cell with multi inside of it? Well, it's more like these, this one group belongs to both of those subgroupings because there's some that are unicellular and some that are multicellular, kind of like the euglena. Although they're single-celled green algae, they move around, so they almost should be with the, with the, with the protozoans. So, Nothing fits exactly right. It's kind of like our study of mitosis and meiosis. You know, is this late prophase? Is this early metaphase? And it's hard to say, but it's kind of in between. Okay, anything else? Because that actually is the